Chapter 31, Dying in Iniquity, Ezekiel chapter 18. The book of Ezekiel chronicles the words of God as he is frustrated with his people. It issues forth his warnings and judgments along with the promises of future restoration from a God who tried to keep a short leash upon his disobedient and rebellious people. In fact, at the timing of the writing of the book of Ezekiel, Judah had been sent into the Babylonian captivity for their iniquity, Ezekiel 39.23, because of abject idolatry. The astute Bible student knows to connect the book of Ezekiel with the same Babylonian captivity mentioned in Jeremiah. Both books issued grave warnings to a rebellious and hard-hearted people who had defiled God's name and his demands concerning worship. Ultimately, God's short lease with Judah and even Israel as a whole was an attempt to sanctify his great name, which was profaned among the heathen, Ezekiel 36.23. Without the reader understanding God's intended purpose, it is impossible to understand the context of these particular writings. The things chronicled in Ezekiel were at least in part so that the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, when I shall be sanctified in you, that is Israel, before their eyes, Ezekiel 36, 23. In fact, that phrase, know that I am the Lord, is found 63 times in the book of Ezekiel. Obviously, God's purpose for the captivity and the promised returns to the land served a dual purpose for both the people of God and the heathen to clearly know that God was God. This was the purpose of writing Ezekiel and Jeremiah. God graciously provided the people of God a watchman, one of whom was named Ezekiel, as such Ezekiel was to hear the word at my, that is the Lord's mouth, and give them, that is the children of Israel, warning from me, Ezekiel 3.17. This practice created a twofold responsibility with a possible threefold outcome. The watchmen and the recipients of the messages each had a certain responsibility, and each would answer for their response to those responsibilities. The watchman, Ezekiel, was to hear the word from God's mouth. He was then responsible for warning the people based upon the message he received. If he refused to perform those duties, he died. Once the people heard the warnings from the mouth of the watchman, they had to choose whether to believe the warnings and repent or continue in rebellion. If the people believed and heeded the warnings, they lived. If they refused the warnings, they died. In fact, the emphasis of both Jeremiah and Ezekiel revolves around physical preservation. It is inconceivable how anyone could teach otherwise. When God's people dwelt in their own land, God was to dwell among them. Capital punishment administered by man served as God's means of keeping Israel pure so that God could dwell in their midst. However, the book of Ezekiel covers a time when Israel was not in their land but taken captive into a pagan land. Rather than the prescribed capital punishment of the law, God determined to use other means to warn his people concerning the consequences of disobedience. His warnings included the sword, famine, and pestilence to shorten the lives of the disobedient. God would implement the principles stated in Deuteronomy via other means in Ezekiel. Deuteronomy 24.16 The fathers shall not be put to death for the children, neither shall the children be put to death for the fathers. Every man shall be put to death for his own sin. In captivity under a foreign rule, Israel could not administer capital punishment, nor did a disobedient people have the will to do so. Ezekiel issued forth the pronouncements to the captives, warnings that the outcome would be the same except the death penalty would be administered by God himself. Ezekiel 3.19 Yet if thou warn the wicked, and he turn not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. The watchman was to warn the wicked. If the wicked refused to turn from his wickedness, he shall die in his iniquity. The watchman warned him, so God did not hold the watchman accountable. The warning concerning judgment is repeatedly given. Ezekiel 18.4, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Ezekiel 18.20, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Ezekiel was God's spokesman or watchman for those who had been taken into captivity in Babylon, Ezekiel 1.1. 1, 1. Here's Ezekiel 33.7. So thou, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman under the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the word at my mouth and warn them from me. Jeremiah, on the other hand, was prophesying to the people during the Babylonian siege against Israel and Jerusalem prior to their captivity. Jeremiah prophesied unto the people the way of life or the way of death. He said, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will set before you the way of life, 
and the way of death. He that abideth in this city shall die by the sword and by the famine and by the pestilence. But he that goeth out and falleth to the Chaldeans that besiege you, he shall live, and his life shall be unto him for a prey. Jeremiah 21, 8 and 9. A matter of faith. These are the words of the Lord that were to be believed and heeded unless they chose to faithlessly reject them. Many of those who entered the Babylonian captivity believed God and acted in faith. Their departure was an act of obedience, one that would grant them an extension to their physical lives. Yet other dangers would await them when they arrived in Babylon. As such, God gave them the watchman, Ezekiel. When Ezekiel recognized the approaching danger in the lives of God's people, Ezekiel was responsible for issuing the warning set forth from the mouth of God. He was the warn the people concerning the impending judgment for their sins. Yet it remained the responsibility of those warned to heed the message of God by faith and repent of their sins. If they heeded the message, they lived. If they ignored the message, they died. It was that simple. Unfortunately, like so many other Bible truths, some Bible teachers have perused Ezekiel and chosen to pull verses or phrases out of their intended context to teach things God never intended to be taught. This is most dramatically demonstrated in three chapters found within Ezekiel, chapters 3, 18, and 33. These well-meaning Bible teachers abuse these passages to quote-unquote prove that the Old Testament teaches a salvation by works under the Old Covenant. The primary phrases that have befuddled those looking to Ezekiel with this mindset are die in his sins, Ezekiel 3.20, and die in his iniquity, Ezekiel 3.18 and 19, Ezekiel 18.18, 18, Ezekiel 33.8, and verse 9. The phrases from these three chapters have been tied to the phrase die in your sins, found in John's Gospel, John 8, 21 and 24. It is dangerous to superimpose New Testament doctrine on Old Testament teachings. To avoid pulling these phrases from Ezekiel out of God's intended context, it is important to read the entire book of Ezekiel, which most people unfortunately find tedious. For those who want to know the truth, this Bible reading proves to be quite liberating from the man-made precepts. Those who do read Ezekiel with an open mind realize that the book does not teach any type of works-based salvation. Before undertaking the false notion of a works-based salvation and the teaching that these phrases mean eternal death rather than physical death, it is important to consider a few preliminary truths. Bible words are often used in more than one context. For instance, the word soul often refers to that internal part of the trichotomy of man, 1 Thessalonians 5.23, Genesis 35.18 but can also be used to identify and speak of man's physical being, especially in the Old Testament. The following scriptural proofs are a sampling of the Bible's usage of soul to refer to the physical rather than limiting it to the internal being of man. Genesis 12.5, and the souls that they had gotten in Haran. Genesis 12.13, Abram speaking to Sarah, my soul shall live because of thee. Genesis 19.20, Lot speaking to God, oh, let me escape thither. Is it not a little one, and my soul shall live? Leviticus 5.2 Or if a soul touch any unclean thing? Leviticus 5.4 Or if a soul swear? Leviticus 5.15 If a soul commit a trespass? Leviticus 5.17 And if a soul sin and commit any of these things, which are forbidden to be done by the commandments of the Lord, though he wist it not, yet he is guilty and shall bear his iniquity. Numbers 19.22, And whatsoever the unclean person toucheth shall be unclean, and the soul that toucheth it shall be unclean until even. 1 Samuel 24.11, David speaking to Saul, I have not sinned against thee, yet thou huntest my soul to take it. Joshua 10.28, And that day Joshua took Makeda and smote it with the edge of the sword, and the king thereof he utterly destroyed them, and all the souls that were therein. He let none remain. He did to the king of Makeda as he did unto the king of Jericho. Proverbs 25.25, 25, As cold waters to a thirsty soul, so is good news from a far country. Proverbs 27.7, 7, The full soul loatheth in honeycomb, but to the hungry soul every bitter thing is sweet. Here is one example from Ezekiel and one from Jeremiah that show that soul can refer to the individual or individuals. Ezekiel 13.18, to hunt souls. Will ye hunt the souls of my people, and will ye save the souls alive that come unto you? Verse 20, Wherefore thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against your pillows, 
wherewith ye there hunt the souls to make them fly, and I will tear them from your arms, and I will let the souls go, even the souls that ye hunt to make them fly. Jeremiah chapter 38, verse 16. So Zedekiah, the king, swear secretly unto Jeremiah, saying, As the Lord liveth, that made us this soul, I will not put thee to death, neither will I give thee into the hand of these men that seek thy life. Then said Jeremiah unto Zedekiah, Thus saith the Lord, the God of hosts, the God of Israel, If thou wilt assuredly go forth unto the king of Babylon's princes, then thy soul shall live, and the city shall not be burned with fire, and thou shalt live in thine house. Verse 20, But Jeremiah said, They shall not deliver thee, obey I beseech thee, the voice of the Lord which I speak unto thee, so it shall be well with thee, and thy soul shall live. Obviously, each of these passages refer to soul and yet point to physical life and the overall individual rather than that part of man which is eternal. Understanding this truth can prove quite enlightening as you continue to review the contents of this discourse. We will consider Ezekiel chapter 18 in the greatest detail, then move on to Ezekiel chapter 33 and finally Ezekiel chapter 3. Ezekiel chapter 18. Any careful reading of Ezekiel chapter 18 points to the focus of the chapter as individual responsibility and accountability. Those Israelites living the days of Ezekiel and Jeremiah were trying to blame their sufferings upon the actions of the forefathers. God's often repeated answer to any such claim was that the soul that sinneth, it shall die, Ezekiel 18.4 and Ezekiel 18.20. In other words, a man physically lived or physically died based upon his own obedience or disobedience. This is certainly not a novel concept and extends from Genesis through Revelation. Yet the people under judgment looked for an easy target to blame. Who easier to blame than those who had already preceded them in death? This self-deception on the part of the people of God is clearly revealed in the first verses of Ezekiel chapter 18. Furthermore, this section offers the clear context for the entire chapter. The Jewish offspring chose to blame their forefathers' acts for the troubles they faced. The proverb clearly expressed their sentiments. The intent of the proverb was to place blame for their sins upon their forefathers. Ezekiel 18.2 what mean ye that ye use this proverb concerning the land of Israel, saying, The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge? Consider the gist of the proverb. The fathers ate sour grapes, but we, the children, are experiencing the effects for their actions. The children are claiming to be judged for what their parents did. No matter how often the proverb was repeated, it was simply untrue. This proverb was claimed by those who went into captivity in Babylon and those who remained behind in the land. We know this because Jeremiah referred to this proverb. Fortunately, Jeremiah defined the proverb as living or dying based upon one's own sin, not the sins of the fathers. Jeremiah 31.29 In those days they shall say no more. The fathers have eaten a sour grape, and the children's teeth are set on edge. Verse 30, But everyone shall die for his own iniquity. Every man that eateth the sour grape, his teeth shall be set on edge. This lesson should be a good one learned by those living today. Stop blaming the people of your past for the decisions that you make and the consequences that you are suffering because of those bad choices. The ensuing verses in the remainder of Ezekiel chapter 18 answer this unfounded proverb and offer the foundational context applicable throughout the remainder of the 18th chapter of Ezekiel. No one was dying for the iniquity or sin of another, and the death contextually refers to physical death and not eternal damnation. Do not miss this truth. Ezekiel 18.3 And as I live, saith the Lord God, ye shall not have occasion any more to use this proverb in Israel. Behold, all souls are mine. The soul is defined as the individual. As the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The warning certainly is not pointing to a regenerated soul dying, only to repent with a soul being regenerated again, only to have this process repeated over again. The reference to soul here, as elsewhere, simply referenced the individual, not the internal part of the triune man. 
Therefore, Ezekiel's warnings are directed toward the physical consequences of a man's actions. These warnings should not be extrapolated to denote the eternal damnation of the soul since the context addresses only the physical and not the eternal. The consequences of disobedience could surely result in physical death. For those who equate obedience to the law as a means of garnering eternal life, this creates a plethora of problems. First, Jeremiah clearly wrote that everyone failed to keep the law from the least of them, even unto the greatest of them. Everyone is given to covetousness, and from the prophet, even unto the priest, everyone dealeth falsely. Jeremiah 6.13 Does this mean that everyone addressed herein ended up in hell? Furthermore, when Jeremiah gave these people the Lord's warnings to walk in the old paths, the people responded, We will not walk therein. Jeremiah 6.16 Obviously, God's people were not capable of earning their salvation, but they could turn from their wickedness and live, thus extending their physical lives. Yet there are those who desire to interject eternal consequences to the actions described, yet it is nowhere in the discussion nor found within the context. The next verse offers the gist of the teaching throughout the Old Covenant and emphasized in the chapter under discussion. Ezekiel 18.5 But if a man be just and do that which is lawful and right, notice that the verse does not say that the man did something to be just, but the just shall do that which is lawful and right. A just man will act and live like a just man. Verse 9, the just man hath walked in my statutes and hath kept my judgments to deal truly. He is just. He shall surely live, saith the Lord God. The context repeatedly involves doing right or doing wrong, living a long life or having one's life cut short. The context is physical life and physical death, not spiritual life and spiritual death. The same false logic used by those misinterpreting these verses would imply that if a man lives justly, his soul is made alive or regenerated. Consider the implications of such a teaching. First, their salvation could not have been based upon obedience to the law because these people were in captivity incapable of keeping a large portion of the Old Testament law. They had no temple, no functioning priesthood, and no sacrificial system. Furthermore, to purport work salvation based upon Ezekiel chapter 18 is to get the cart before the horse. To clarify, those who would teach work salvation would suggest that a man could be just if he could keep his long laundry list of works. See Ezekiel 18, 5 through 9. Was the man saved or safe from premature physical death when he did that which is lawful and right, hath not eaten upon the mountains, neither hath lifted up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, neither hath defiled his neighbor's wife, neither hath come near to a menstruous woman, hath not oppressed any, hath restored to the debtor his pledge, hath spoiled none by violence, hath given his bread to the hungry, hath covered the naked with a garment, hath not given forth upon usury, neither hath taken any increase, hath withdrawn his hand from iniquity, hath executed true judgment between man and man, hath walked in God's statutes, hath kept God's judgments to deal truly. For those with the inclination to proclaim an Old Testament works for salvation, the inclusion of the phrase, he is just, in the middle of Ezekiel 18.9, has led them to believe that men became just by doing these things. Yet the passage opened by stating that a man who was just would do these things, Ezekiel 18.5, not that works would justify anyone. There is a big difference. A man is not just because he does certain of these things. He that is just does these righteous acts. For those who teach that a man could be justified based upon his own merit and work, would this not allow the individual to boast for his own effort? The second view, the scriptural one, teaches that a man is just by faith in doing what God said to do, and the good works that follow are based upon the inner workings of faith in God's word. In this case, justification is based upon God's merits and attributes to him, all the praise for saving a man despite himself. If the above list offered the plan of salvation as some teach, then one would expect that salvific plan to be consistent, especially throughout the same book of the Bible. However, this is simply not the case. In fact, there's another list concerning his son, just a verse below the previous context. The question asked, If he beget a son that does these things, shall he then live? Should a son live that is a robber, a shedder of blood, that doeth the like to any one of these things? 
that doeth not any of those duties, hath eaten upon the mountains, defiled his neighbor's wife, hath oppressed the poor and needy, hath spoiled by violence, hath not restored the pledge, hath lifted up his eyes to the idols, hath committed abomination, hath given forth upon usury, hath taken increase. Obviously, the list has some overlap, but it is not an identical list. The question being asked was whether a man would continue to live upon the earth if he were guilty of the above list of things, and God's answer was that he shall not live. He hath done all these abominations. He shall surely die. His blood shall be upon him. The whole point of the passage was whether a person reaped the consequences for his own sins or the sins of his father. God could not express these truths any clearer when read within the context minus all the preconceived man-made philosophies. The point is that everyone died for his own sin or enjoyed a longer life for refusing to follow his father's bad example. Ezekiel 18.14 Now lo, if he beget a son that seeth all his father's sins which he hath done, and considereth it, and doeth not such like, verse 17, he shall not die for the iniquity of his father, he shall surely live. The son who witnessed his father's sins and chose to turn from such behavior lived. Yet this right living did not earn the son's salvation of his soul. In other words, although his father's life was shortened for this bad behavior, 2 Kings 10, 31 and 32, the son should choose to obey and live a longer life. The obedience certainly did not mean that his soul was regenerated based upon his departure from his father's wicked ways. The point in Ezekiel chapter 18 was to refute the proverb that suggested that the offspring were being punished for the sins of the fathers. The truth was, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. In fact, this point was reiterated in verse 20. Ezekiel 18.20, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. Still not sufficiently convinced? Consider verse 19. Yet say ye, why doth not the Son bear the iniquity of the Father? Again, this is the whole point of the passage. Doth not the Son bear the iniquity of the Father? The answer is emphatically no. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. When the Son hath done that which is lawful and right, and hath kept all my statutes, and hath done them, he shall surely live. The one who does right enjoys longer life upon the earth. But the context nowhere indicates that they experience a regeneration of soul. Several examples teach these concepts, but none much better than the book of Jonah. Like Nineveh, after the preaching of Jonah, the judgment in Ezekiel's ministry was pronounced by the watchmen. But the individuals were given an opportunity to get right before the pronounced judgment fell. In Jonah's ministry, the city of Nineveh believed God's word, repented, and God spared them. What an amazing, gracious, and merciful God! Jonah 3, 4. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey. And he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. What saved the people of Nineveh from death and destruction? The same thing that would save a person alive after hearing the warning found in Ezekiel. Like Nineveh, the wicked man was warned to turn from all his sins. Notice what caused the people of Nineveh to do right. The people of Nineveh believed God. Faith saved the lives of the people of Nineveh. The same held true for those in Ezekiel. Believe God, turn from sin, and live. Ezekiel 18.21 but if the wicked will turn from all his sins that he hath committed and keep all my statutes and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. The message is simple. Do right and live longer. Verse 22. All his transgressions that he hath committed, they shall not be mentioned unto him in his righteousness that he hath done, he shall live. The context is not the promise of eternal life, but a longer physical life upon the earth. Have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, saith the Lord God, and not that he should return from his ways and live? 
What a gracious, merciful, and long-suffering God. Man's wickedness called for death, but God offered the wicked an opportunity or space of time to repent. When a judgment was pronounced, those who by faith believed God did repent. It was faith that caused anyone to turn from his sin and live. As such, the wicked were warned to turn from their wickedness, and the righteous were warned not to get weary in well-doing and trust in past righteousness. Ezekiel 18.24 But when the righteous turneth away from his righteousness, and committeth iniquity, and doeth according to all the abominations that the wicked man doeth, shall he live? All his righteousness that he hath done shall not be mentioned. In his trespass that he hath trespassed, and his sin that he hath sinned, in them shall he die. When a man turned from his righteousness, he was warned. Those who refused the watchman's warning were admonished concerning the shortening of life. This biblical principle can be found in the lives of others, i.e. Samson, Saul, etc. Did Samson die in his sins? Samson failed to do right when he violated his Nazarite vow and never brought the prescribed sacrifice for his sin. What eventually happened to him? He died in a suicidal act of vengeance, yet he did so calling upon the Lord by faith, Judges 16.28. And Samson called on the Lord and said, O Lord God, remember me, I pray thee, and strengthen me, I pray thee, only this once, O God, that I may be at once avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. Imagine teaching that Samson was saved by faith and works. He certainly had no works to brag about when he died. He died in an act of vengeance, but died trusting and calling upon the Lord. Samson's shortened life and death had nothing to do with eternity, just as those in Ezekiel's day who died in disobedience. Their shortened life did not mean that they all ended up in hell. When someone became rebellious and refused to heed the warnings of the watchman, he died. It is that simple. Ezekiel 18.26 When a righteous man turneth away from his righteousness and committeth iniquity and dieth in them... For his iniquity that he hath done shall he die. Again, when the wicked man turneth away from his wickedness that he hath committed, and doeth that which is lawful and right, he shall save his soul alive. Because he considereth and turneth away from all his transgressions that he hath committed, he shall surely live, he shall not die. The final verses of Ezekiel chapter 18 clearly summarize the principles taught throughout the chapter and throughout the book of Ezekiel. God warned the nation that he would judge them. The only response that offered any opportunity to extend life was for the people to repent and turn from their iniquities. Otherwise, they would face their ruin. Ezekiel 18.30 Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel. Everyone according to his ways, saith the Lord God, repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions, so iniquity shall not be your ruin. Cast away from you all your transgressions, whereby ye have transgressed, and make you a new heart and a new spirit, For why will ye die, O house of Israel? I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, saith the Lord God. Wherefore, turn yourselves and live ye. How can anyone miss the import of the teaching throughout the chapter? Repent and turn or die a premature death. In fact, this was the guaranteed outcome of disobedience. What was the promise given to the one keeping the commandments? Was it eternal life, a home in heaven, or paradise? No. Absolutely no. The promise for keeping the commandments was clearly associated to the lengthening of one's days upon the earth, long life. Proverbs 3, one, My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments, for length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. Read the underlying promise in the previous verse again and again. Solomon told his son, Keep my commandments for length of days and long life. Can anything be clearer than that? No mere mortal can make any such promise unless the commandments are derived from God himself. Do right and live a full life. Then why do some of the brethren insist that keeping the law offered more than an extended life on earth or in the land? Indoctrination is a hard thing to overcome, especially when one's pride is at stake. The next passages should seal the deal. Deuteronomy 4.40 Thou shalt keep therefore his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee this day, that it may go well with thee and with the children after thee, and that thou mayest prolong thy days upon the earth, which the Lord thy God giveth thee forever. The promise was longer life, not eternal life, for doing right. Proverbs 9.10 The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. For by me thy days shall be multiplied, and the years of thy life shall be increased. 
The promise was longer life, not eternal life, for doing right. Psalm 34, 11. Come, ye children, hearken unto me, and I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is he that desireth life and loveth many days, that he may see good? Keep thy tongue from evil and thy lips from speaking guile. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The promise throughout the Bible is the lengthening of days for right living. This truth extends throughout the Bible. Obedience has the promise of extended life even today. Ezekiel is not an archaic Old Testament book with no spiritual and practical application to the church today. Every time God issues the warning to Israel, Christians should take notice of the seriousness of sin. Consider the examples from the Pauline epistles concerning these same truths. Ephesians 6.1 Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. The promise of shortened life for living disobediently extends from cover to cover in the Bible. Romans 8.13 For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. The choice is longer life or an early death. All of these quotes, including many others, match Ezekiel's teachings. Both are talking about judgment upon the physical life or death. 1 Corinthians 3.17 1 Corinthians 3.17 If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. If any of these passages refer to salvation by works, the only person that could be saved is someone who receives absolution from all sin upon his deathbed. These false teachings originated from false man-made religions. Men simply read the Bible and force their private interpretations into their own way of thinking and then devise salvific systems to match their teachings. Lastly, consider the teaching concerning the Lord's Supper. We are to judge ourselves so that we do not have to be judged by God. 1 Corinthians 11:27 Wherefore whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord but let a man examine himself and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup for he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself not discerning the Lord's body for this cause many are weak and sickly among you and many sleep for if we would judge ourselves we should not be judged what happens to the individual who partakes of the Lord's Supper unworthily? Thank God for his mercy and grace and long-suffering, but he can choose to judge the unworthy and make them weak or sickly. In some cases, he can choose to bring their lives to an abrupt and early demise. Every one of us needs to examine things that happen in our lives to determine why we experience certain outcomes. The point of Ezekiel, live right, live longer, live wrong, and experience a shortened life. Old Testament Redemption Bible study does not take place in a vacuum. Yet when we think of redemption, we usually consider it from a salvific perspective, but the Bible does not limit the word's usage to this single meaning. Notice the various Old Testament usages of redemption of the soul. Salvation. The Lord redeems the soul of those who trust in him. Psalm 34, 22. The Lord redeemeth the soul of his servants, and none of them that trust in him shall be desolate. Salvation. David proclaimed that the Lord redeemed his soul. Psalm 71, 23. My lips shall greatly rejoice when I sing unto thee, and my soul which thou hast redeemed. David proclaimed that the Lord redeemed his soul from adversity. 2 Samuel 4, 9. And David answered Rahab and Benaiah, his brother, the sons of Rimon, the Bethrite, and said unto them, As the Lord liveth, who hath redeemed my soul out of all adversity? David proclaims that the Lord redeemed his soul out of all distress. 1 Kings one twenty nine. And the king swear and said, As the Lord liveth, that hath redeemed my soul out of all distress. Even as I swear unto thee by the Lord God of Israel, saying, Assuredly, Solomon thy son shall reign after me, and he shall sit upon my throne in my stead. Even so will I certainly do this day. Jeremiah proclaimed that the Lord redeemed his life. Lamentations 3.58 O Lord, thou hast pleaded the causes of my soul, thou hast redeemed my life. Forcing Bible words into preconceived meanings creates irreconcilable problems. In these five examples, redemption could refer to salvation or it could refer to physical deliverance. The context determines the meaning with redemption as it does with every other subject matter in the Bible. This is the end of chapter 31.